All right. So, uh, hi everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us today. This is the first iteration of our Open Chat series organized by the Advocacy Special Interest Group of OPERAs. So OPERAs itself stands for an organization uh, dedicated to open scholarly communication in the European research area for social sciences and humanities. So we thought that this would be a very useful way of connecting with our target audience, with scholars in the humanities and social sciences, and to um, discuss one of the most fundamental uh, issue that this organization is engaged in. So the question of uh, why uh, do open science and how to do it in practice. So I myself, so I'm Oli Spormat, I'm assistant professor in East Asian history at Official Rand University, and I am the creator and host of uh, a podcast series, Humanista, which is about the role and significance of the humanities in the 21st century. And this was the platform that brought me to OPRAS as well when I was invited by them to present on my podcast as a form of open scholarly communication. Um, so I am also a member of the special interest group along with uh, some other um, participants of this meeting today. And uh, so for this first iteration of this session or this series, we thought that we could start with some fundamental questions. So the overarching question here is about why advocate for open scholarly communication in uh, the social sciences and humanities, which I think is inherently related to the question of why go open access or why do open science and uh, why, is, why is this uh, important and relevant? Um, but I also think that at the same time, as much as this is also very important, I think based on my experience talking to, to scholars in the SSH field and being one of them myself, I also think that a lot of the times the question is not necessarily um, about whether or not go uh, open, but it, sometimes it's at least as much the question of how to do this in practice. So some scholars don't need to be convinced, they just don't necessarily know how to do this and they end up just sticking to these traditional ways of publishing, not because they don't want to go open, but because they don't know how to go open. So I thought that we could somehow combine these two fundamental questions about what is uh, open science and why is this relevant to us? And the more practical question of how to, how to do this um, in practice. Um, so I think this could serve as a sort of starting point or as a basis for further discussion uh, and for the uh, later sessions of this series. So, but before we delve into the discussion with our special guest, Pilaspos, who is head of library research and publishing support at the University Library of UIT, the Arctic University of Norway, um, let's start with a brief presentation about OPRES it's, uh, itself, because just for those of you who may not be familiar with the organization itself. So this will be presented by Carla Vanso, uh, community manager at OPRES. Carla, would you? please. <laughs> uh, thank you, Alice. I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay, so I'm going to very briefly present uh, operas in case you don't know it yet. So as uh, Alice already said, uh, OPERAS stands for the research infrastructure uh, that uh, is going to support, that supports open scholarly communication in the social sciences and humanities in the Europe, European research area. If you want to uh, learn more, to see more details, you can go to our website. And later, if you need, I can share this uh, presentation with you as well. So uh, what's OPERA's mission? It's to coordinate and federate resources in Europe. And doing that, uh, it wants to efficiently address the scholarly communication needs of European researchers in the field of SSH. So that's our uh, broader mission. And the objective is to achieve a scholarly communication system where knowledge produced in the SSH benefits researchers, academics, students, and more generally the, the whole society across Europe and worldwide. 
So in short, our objective is to really make open science a reality for research in the SSH, uh, considering all the different actors, all the different stakeholders of the field. Uh, nowadays, OPRAS is uh, involved in different uh, European funded projects, and it's on its way to become uh, an ERIC. And what is important to know about OPRAS is that it has two main pillars. One of its pillars are the services it offers uh, the community in general. And these services, uh, nowadays, they are organized in some categories that are uh, uh, analytic services, discovery services, quality assurance services, research for society, and uh, future services. So these services are in different levels of development. You can check them all on, on our website. And the second pillar that is also very important is the community of operas. And the community gathers in the special interest groups. We, uh, currently, we have seven, uh, around seven different topics. And one of these special interest groups is uh, advocacy. So this one that is uh, bringing to you this uh, open chat series, just to bring all these questions regarding open science and SSH uh, to discuss it lively with the, the broader community. So if you have uh, any questions later, you can uh, contact me if you want to know more about operas. I will add my email address to the chat. And that's it. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Carla. Uh, well, um, then I think we can uh, move on to the uh, actual discussion. So, like I said, we have a special guest, uh, Per Pipinaspos, welcome, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Um, <laughs> Thanks for having me. I mean, it's, uh, uh, I'm not part of Operas myself, but I know people who are, and I've always been curious about what's really going on in here. Uh, so thank you for, for organizing this. Uh, well, thank you. And um, well, I thought I would start this the way I tend to, to do so in my podcast. So I tend to usually let my guests introduce themselves briefly. So to give them the freedom to, to say what they consider important about themselves instead of me doing so. So Per, would you, would you mind just saying a couple of words about what you would like uh, the audience to know about your your work and your connection to open science? Well, um, my background is in, uh, in the humanities. I, I, um, I work mainly with uh, neo-Latin literature and, and history, particularly history of science from the early modern period, intellectual history. Um, and um, I took my PhD exactly 10 years ago. Uh, but ever since I worked in the library, but I, I still do research uh, part time. Uh, so, so I'm sort of in these dilemmas of openness on my ever, in my everyday life as a scholar. Uh, but in the library, uh, I am also trying my best to organize a group of, uh, of research librarians uh, who try and make services to this UIT, as it's called, the University of Tromsø, the Arctic University of Norway. It's actually not only in Tromsø, which is a town in the far north of Norway, but it's distributed across many uh, other uh, places in northern Norway. So we have, we have big university with um, uh, way beyond 10,000 students and, and lots of staff in, in all kinds of disciplines. So I try to sort of organize work, especially in terms of open science support services, for the faculty all across northern Norway, you could say it's 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 a huge task, and it's not only social sciences and humanities. But what I experience when I talk to professors, whatever their discipline, is that we have some common ground. We have some things in common. We we do publishing. We we're faced with peer review. We're faced with journals. We're faced with uh, dilemmas of open access. So so there are there is some some common ground between disciplines. And very often, 
uh, we can learn a lot as humanists from the STEM uh, uh, disciplines. I mean, the the uh, the hard sciences. Uh, they are often very very digitally uh, attuned um, in their work. So they have developed workflows that are way beyond the the standard ivory tower. Uh, philosopher, uh, you could say, uh, the way of working um, in the humanities in the old days is, is far, far away from them. But then you have digital humanities trying to sort of uh, pick the best pieces from the, the natural sciences and, 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 uh, and implement them in, in the way we do humanities. So they are, of course, interesting developments. And um, as I said, in my role uh, as head of library research and publishing support, we try and and uh, and help researchers move forward in in a more digital manner and in particular also in a more open manner. Great. So, hmm. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's a. I guess that's basically the the introduction. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So. Um, like I said, uh, I thought that in terms of structure, we could start with some of these more uh, fundamental questions about what do we mean when we talk about open science and um, why does it matter? And then we can move on to some more practical questions about how to, how to do this uh, with some examples as well. So I hope this will all be uh, useful to, to you. And um, one thing to mention, so this is an open chat. So, please by no means feel like this is a formal interview be between Per and myself. So if you have any questions or, or feedback or just would like to, to jump in, feel free to do so by um, uh, putting your question into the chat box or by raising your hand and uh, unmuting yourself. So if you wish to speak up. So like I said, this is more of a flexible and informal discussion. So the, the goal is to, to, to be as relevant and useful uh, to you, our audience, as possible. Okay, so uh, what about uh, starting with this this very seemingly trivial question of open science? I think many people have different uh, definitions of this. So uh, I thought we could start with your take on this there. So what do you think, how, how would you even define or how would you approach the question of what is open science and why is this important to scholars in the humanities and social sciences? Well, bottom line of open science to me is that there should be no paywalls for content that is made available online. So that's academic content, whatever we produce as scholars should be available on the internet for free. That, that's sort of the basics of it, I would say. Uh, but then you have other aspects like and this is where university libraries, for instance, they come in trying to make things stored on the internet so that it can be refound. We need to have good metadata. We need to have stable URLs so that uh, people can find it even in five years, for instance. It should be transparent and stable online. Um, and we also need tools for um, for finding uh, the, the materials and uh, I mean, the search engines and, and stuff. Um, so that is open science that things should be available for free on the internet. But I think there's also increasingly an awareness that we need to have the scholars to lead this, to, to define what is it that we need and to sort of be the, the ones that own these infrastructures and own this scholarly communication system. So that's more of a political thing, but it's becoming more and more now uh, uh, in the, this, the discussions about open science, this is becoming more and more prominent, this idea of scholar-led infrastructure, scholar-led uh, ways of communication. So then you have open source is one aspect, but another aspect is the economic side to it. So you have for instance, in, in journal publishing, there is now increasing awareness of the, the, the concept called diamond open access, which means that it's free, not, for the end, not just for the end user. You can always access for free what's in an open diamond open access journal, but it's also free for the author. There is no article processing 
charge. So these kinds of infrastructures to build them, maintain them, and make them, um, and 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 raise the quality standard of of the uh, of these uh, journals. I think is a, an important challenge for the future. And this is something where uh, this is an area. I mean, diamond open access is an area where I think, uh, for instance, social sciences and humanities scholars can have a lot of um, input and 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 uh, because. We are used, many of us humanists are used to, to write things that are not actually, uh, it, it's not so, um, it's not something that people are willing to pay uh, much for anyway. So it's it's not, um, so why not make it completely out of these economics structures and, uh, and, and make it free, um, both for the authors and for the readers. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned the, the financial aspects of this situation, because that's also been my impression that um, I also think that some, sometimes uh, the problem here is not that scholars don't want their work to be shared openly, but it's sometimes about not being able to afford it. So a lot of journals, especially some of these very high prestige uh, journals are actually not open access by default. So uh, and even if they offer the option to scholars to, to make their individual uh, uh, contribution open access, so they, they would expect the author to, to, to contribute financially to this quite significantly. And this, these, these, these costs are usually way beyond uh, the capacity of, of the scholars. And this is why many of them just uh, end up sticking to, to, to this more traditional uh, way of publishing. So I think this actually reminded me of, of, of a podcast episode that you kindly shared with me before we uh, came to this, this event, um, where, where you talk about the, uh, the question of open science from a historical perspective in relation to book history and, and the idea of why being open or why not be uh, open. So these pros and cons of, of being open or not, I think it's a very interesting uh, conversation and there, uh, you use the term vanity that, that really uh, made an impression on me. So, that, so, so sometimes scholars are driven by vanity and, and the prestige of a journal. So, so vanity in this, this context. So uh, they feel the need to, to, to publish in these uh, high profile journals because that's the way uh, to, to career advancement. So sometimes uh, they feel like they have no choice but to do so. However, the problem is that these journals are often not uh, open access. So, and then you also suggested other ways of, of, of making one's, one's work public, but um, what, what, how do you think the, the question of vanity is, is related to, 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 to open science and how could this, this, this be conceptualized for, for humanities and social science scholars who are, who are somehow torn between the importance of publishing in high profile journals while also trying to, to, to make their work public and open? Yeah, um, when I use concepts like vanity, it's 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 slightly provocative to say the least. I mean, it's it's um, to to us that have a permanent uh, job. I think it's it's mainly vanity that steers us towards these high uh, impact factor journals. There is no other excuse actually why we wouldn't use uh, some newer schol uh, scholarly led uh, outlet which is um, non commercial and uh, um, so so. In our case, those of us who have a permanent job, it's 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 mainly vanity. But for for PhDs and postdocs, they are they are trying to get the next assignment. They are trying to get the next uh, next uh, job, and and for them, they need to have a good CV. And uh, and then uh, if if they have the the feeling, which can be well, there can be foundation to this feeling or this uh, this sense that. Uh, committees will tend to to evaluate the, each candidate basis on the basis of their cv and 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 which journals they have published in in that in those cases you can't really say it's it's vanity that steers them towards these high it is is there they need a job so it's it's they need the bread and butter so so that's why they do it but but i do believe that um, that vanity in terms of judging the quality of each other uh, seeing uh, where the, the, the logos uh, of, of of the journals that we have used is is uh, not a very scientific way to go about this um, the entire academic literature. Um, 
And uh, I've used also another term, which is even more provocative. Uh, it was in a in a in a newspaper, uh, online newspaper that most uh, uh, most academics here in Norway tend to read. It's called Krono. It's in Norwegian. But I used the term logo fetishism, um, which was even more <laughs> provocative. But you know, you shouldn't really judge a scholarly work based on how it's been wrapped. And, and, and the logo outside the package, it's, it's actually the, what's inside the package, which counts. And, and that is where I think, at least as I know, humanities and social sciences committees, they tend, in fact, to read what has been published by a candidate, not just judge it by the cover. So I think in general, we are better positioned than in many natural sciences, which are so competitive like if you if i mean if you announce a postdoc position in in in, in one of the high prestige uh, universities uh, in in chemistry for instance you, you get 200 postdoc uh, postdoc applicants and, and how to make the a committee committed to read actually all the papers that each of these 200 candidates have written it's 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 hard to do practically right so then in those cases, journal impact factor and so on. It's 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 um, it's easy to understand how it came into the picture. Okay. Uh, whereas here in the humanities, at least, yeah, Norway is a, is a high income country, right? So it's it's kind of popular, but in a postdoc position here, we we get not that kind of uh, that number of of applicants, at least not in the humanities. So there we have the chance if we are on a committee to actually read everything. Um, so there, uh, there you have the, the DORA declaration, uh, which I think is when many people read this, uh, the DORA declaration on research assessment, San Francisco declaration on research assessment, I believe it's the full name. Uh, when people in humanities and social sciences read it, they say, hey, this is what we do. <laughs> What's, why do we need such a declaration? Whereas in in um, in the STEM uh, subjects, they they tend to be, oh, raise an eyebrow. How can we then lead a committee if we can't use journal factor? This is absurd. Like so, so I think we are better positioned after all in the humanities and social sciences to do to evaluate research based on the content and not on the the wrapping or the logo. Mm -hmm. mm. Wow. Uh, well, uh, I think now we can move on to some more practical questions and, and examples. So let's say that someone is determined to make their work uh, open and uh, share it with the wider world. Uh, so I was wondering if you could give us some advice on how to proceed and what steps one can make if one wants to make their scholarly work open. And are there any, any specific challenges or pitfalls to keep in mind when one wants to do so? Yeah. Um... <clears throat> There is now, I'm sorry for sticking to journal articles. It's, it's not the only thing that we could talk about. I, I guess we can move on to other aspects of open science uh, later on, but, but let's stick to journal articles just uh, as a start. Um, all the journals that I know of that, uh, that I can publish in, some of them are with a subscription or, or you need to pay to publish there and so on, but nearly all of them have the option of taking care of your latest accepted manuscript and then upload it so that it can be available. Uh, it will lack the logo of the publisher. It will be my latest manuscript version after peer review, the latest thing that I sent to the editor of the journal, basically. And that we, we tell all, all our researchers to, to, um, to keep and to, to upload so that it can be made available in, in the repository of the university, which is fully open access. So this so-called green open access route, I think it's really important to tell people about because many people, they have no, no idea that their institution has such a repository or that it's legal to do so. So when we tell them, they tend to do so. Uh, so that I think is a, an important thing to, to bear in mind to advocate for green open access. Because some, some people, they want to use these uh, high-profiled journals for a reason. I mean, they need to have good peer review and they need to have uh, to reach their target audience. So if you do research in <laughs> uh, the history of uh, 
of uh, optics or something. You, perhaps you need to use a journal called the Journal of Optics History or something. And, and, and that is your journal. It happens to be behind paywall, but you, you are allowed still to take, um, to take that latest manuscript version and make that available online. It's peer reviewed work and it should be done. So, so I think that is an important message. It's, it sounds trivial, but, uh, but it helps uh, to promote open access. Yeah, I think this is this is great that you mentioned this because based on my impression, there tends to be some sort of confusion between uh, among scholars about which version of their paper is 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 free to share. So especially if they uh, if they, they end up publishing the paper in a uh, in a journal that's uh, behind the paywall. So they are, sometimes they are not just not sure whether they are uh, they are they have the right to 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 somehow share their paper in any form. Uh, or, or if the, even if they do know, they are not not always sure about which 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 version uh, is 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 free to share. So this is great that you you, you mentioned it. I think um, to be honest, I have to say that this is this is a confusion that not all, that's not only limited to to the authors, but sometimes even to, to journal editors. So I have found myself asking an editor whether or not I'm, I'm allowed to share my work. And they say, yeah, 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 feel free to do so. But then they got into a, a, some sort of a contradiction uh, in terms of what, which which version would be would be uh, uh, possible for me to share. So even they were not hundred percent sure about which one would be um, uh, which one could be available. So I think this is this is great that this uh, came up. Um, and by the way. Um, I, I was also wondering what you think about these platforms. So when it comes to platforms, you mentioned uh, these institutional repositories, which, uh, which are available at most institutions. Um, but I was also wondering about these more uh, generic platforms as well that are independent from institutions like ac academia.edu or ResearchGate uh, or even Zenodo. So I was wondering about your opinion about this, because there seems to be some sort of debate and uh, controversy about these platforms and how useful they are. Well, it's I, I definitely think they are useful, um, but they shouldn't be a substitute for institutional repositories because you never know who will buy them and, and lock them in in the future. Uh, so, so I remember signing up to, to Academia you uh, for uh, so, some years ago and then everything was completely free but then nowadays I get emails saying that hey you want to know who cited your work join up for the premium version and that will cost me money and I don't want to pay <laughs> because I think as I said uh, such platforms should be completely free. I believe there are alternatives uh, like uh, humanities commons uh, where which tend to be more and more open it seems um, in terms of uh, of uh, the, the the monetary aspect of it if if you if you will uh, but this is uh, something that I said is, is is a great supplement to to what we do as scholars it's a great supplement to the the proper journals and the proper repositories uh, the professional repositories of each uh, institution for instance but it's not something that can really replace them as I see it now Mm -hmm. uh, and what do you think about Zenodo? Because uh, that even allows people to uh, make available uh, pieces that are that haven't even gone through peer review, for example. What well, this could actually just constitute a whole different discussion about the uh, the role of peer review. Um, but uh, in in general, what do you think about uh, places like like Zenodo for not not just in terms of um, sharing your research, but also in terms of what kind of impact these, uh, these platforms can have on the future of, uh, of research in the social sciences and the humanities specifically. So when people can simply share their work there and how, does it, how is this related to, to quality assurance, for example? I have, I have no objections to 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 Zenodo and other so-called pre-print uh, ways of of making your work public. It's it's uh, it's just important that it's it's marked properly. That it's um, that it is not uh, a a work that has gone through peer review. And then uh, then it's just fine. Um, uh, and and um, sometimes. Uh, if something really dramatic happens, and and like me, a historian, uh, I can sort of 
say something about current issues that are really dramatic and happening just now, uh, then I can't, if I want to reach a bigger audience, then uh, why not use such uh, such a platform to 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 say it uh, immediately? Like this has historic precedents uh, and and so on. So I could sort of engage uh, through Zenodo. It's I have no no issues with that at all. Um, and I think also in other scholarly fields, uh, the, the, they have this so-called archive uh, the, with the, the big Greek he letter. Uh, it's, it's, it's like a big X archive. You have bio archive and, and others. And, and there these preprints are used so much in certain scholarly fields I, I've heard. Uh, it's now so important uh, that they don't really care about which journal a, prop, uh, a paper ends up being published in. It's it's there in 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 the archive, and that's where they read it first, and that's what they they discuss. They don't wait for this peer review process. So uh, there is a great potential also, and, and I think uh, initiatives like Zenodo they can foster this kind of speed in scholarly communication, also in humanities and social sciences in the future. And I, I believe that will be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, by the way, we just got a comment from Jenny in the chat uh, in relation to academia.edu and ResearchGate. Um, yeah, so they are great for sharing, but they are not interoperable in the same way that repositories, be it institutional or generic, such as Zenodo, nor do they guarantee persistent access. Um, yeah, uh, Jenny, would, uh, would you like to elaborate on this or? <laughs> 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 I'm sure I might. I'm a librarian by background, although I'm working in a kind of scholarly comms uh, research environment role in a research and knowledge exchange office uh, now. So, so I, I've been, I talk, I've talked to researchers across many disciplines over the years, and, and I've always very much been. I've never said don't use sharing tools. All depend on your discipline, and and for some disciplines, it's academia.edu. Sometimes it's ResearchGate. Sometimes it's LinkedIn. So they're really good ways for for sharing that that material. But what they don't do is they don't guarantee that that material will always be there. And I think that's that's a really key kind of role of institutional repositories uh, and and other repositories is that they they capture this research they they preserve it most of the time not always um, and and they kind of give it that persistent identifier and it means it's there for the long term and I think that's really important there's so much content nowadays that that is lost because it's up on a website and the website is taken down so yeah so I just thought it was worth worth kind of mentioning that I don't it's not a and or you can kind of do both things. It's just understanding um, the implications um, of, of using one tool over another. Could I follow up on that? Uh, thanks. Uh, a brilliant comment. And, and if we move on from, from then articles and, and uh, to, to research data, I mean, most humanists, uh, they don't, tend to think of themselves as generating data, but many do, in fact. And, and, and I realized myself that I, 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 in fact, assemble data. I had never thought of it in that way um, until I had colleagues here at the University Library setting up a, a repository for, for research data sets, a generic repository for all kinds of disciplines. And I realized that, <laughs> Hey, very often I, I I compile data sets. Like I write an article about uh, yeah um, a researcher in the past, for instance, and I go through his correspondence and I make a list of all his correspondence and which dates uh, the, these letters were sent and from which town to which town and and so on. Uh, and then I have in fact a huge data set. But I don't think of it as a data set. I just write my article about this scholar and how he was connected with the world and uh, it gets through peer review and it's fine. But then uh, I started uh, to, to, to practice this of, of when I collect this kind of or systematize my reading, so to speak, I, I think of it as a data set. So it's, it's kind of supplementary material to a journal article, but it also has its own life in the repository for research data sets. But there, as I'm not very technically minded myself, I need help with the formatting, not use uh, so-called proprietary uh, systems uh, when uh, like Excel, I need to go from Excel to another more permanent way of storing it with using other uh, open source um, uh, tools. 
uh, things like that, I need help for. And that's an important thing where I see, where I see also a slight danger with, with things like Zenodo. Things are just put online with no librarian or, or specialists in, in IT storage uh, taking care of it. So there is a slight danger there that things can be put online, but it's not put online in a way which makes it reusable in five years from now, and not even with metadata, which is also a very boring word, but you know, keywords and, and small introduction. What is it actually? Uh, these kinds of readme files explaining, okay, this is a data set. This was compiled in this manner. Uh, I skipped all that, but I kept, I, uh, I, I, uh, I made this selection. Uh, I, I used this methodology as things like that. I always need to, to write when I upload my research data set. And there are people at the library helping me do that. So this is where I see both an opportunity for humanities, but also a challenge for us. We need to get in touch with the, the specialists that can help us doing this in the proper manner. Yeah, I'm glad that, that this problem, so the, the question of sustainability also came up. So I'm involved in digital humanities too. And, and I can see this firsthand that some of these multi-year projects uh, in digital humanities that take a lot of work to accomplish, just simply disappear a few years later uh, because there's no one who would take, uh, take care of the project that they put online, especially if the scholar moves to a different institution. So, uh, and, 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 the, and the, pro but the project remains on the server of the original institution, then it can uh, very easily disappear. So this is, this is a real danger, even for a non-digital humanities project, but especially for those that are like that, or that are born digital by nature. Um, yeah, and to remain in the uh, realm of practice, um, so I was also wondering if there are any other resources that you would recommend there uh, that people can turn to if they are interested in learning more about open access and open science and, and, and where they could publish their, their work in an open format. Yeah, I would then recommend something that I haven't done myself. <laughs> uh, it's to sign up to, to summer schools in digital humanities and stuff like that, uh, where, you, where you get, uh, as far as I can tell, excellent uh, help in, in uh, developing your, your digital skills attuned to humanities uh, uh, way of working. Um, so that's, that's one. <laughs> basic uh, thing to to build your digital skills uh, in the discipline that you or or the kinds of dis digital skills that you need in order to do proper uh, work in in the humanities for instance uh, so that's one uh, thing but uh, the other is to uh, to try and stay informed uh, and and i guess guess operas is is an excellent uh, place to to be on the lookout for what's what's new and and to sign up for uh, for events where where you have workshops in in uh, that are in in themes that I guess all scholars these days uh, should actually know about uh, themes like open access, uh, research data management, and, and stuff like that. It's 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 part of our general Bildung, if you use this. Uh, German word, uh, how to translate it into English, I'm not so sure. It's, it's uh, to be, um, you, you, can you help me out with the Bildung, the notion of Bildung? It's, it's, it's about generic skills and a generic mindset about how to do things uh, uh, with a proper philosophical attitude, so to speak. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's like a sort of skill building or education or, yeah, something like that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, one thing before we we, we talk more about the uh, the future of uh, open science um, and and some geographical questions as well about local or more uh, generic approaches to this. One thing I wanted to just um, interject here is is about alternative platforms for sharing scholarly work. So so far we've thought about uh, journal articles for the most part. But written contributions are by no means the only way of self-expression uh, in, in the humanities and social science as well. Uh, and, and especially nowadays, so podcasts are becoming more and more popular for as a form of knowledge sharing, but in an audio format. 
And this applies to the uh, to, to humanists as well. So I'm involved in this too. And um, you have also experience in, in doing podcasts. So that's why I'm, I'm, I thought I would bring this up. So how do you see the, the, the role of podcasts and, as a form of free and, uh, and, and really open access scholarly communication? And how do you see their, their place and their, and their value um, as a form of, of open science? Well, brilliant question. Um, I think podcasts is what people tend to listen to in terms of, uh, of, of their uh, long-term staying informed, their long-term building. <laughs> this is what the intellectuals tend to listen to these days um, when we do our, uh, our, our, yeah, we do the dishes or, or the laundry or whatever, we listen to podcasts, many of us. Uh, so I believe there is, 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 a, is a huge potential to reach out to people who have this kind of intellectual mindset. They want to stay informed and they, are, they, they happen to be researchers. Um, and how to do podcasts <laughs> sustainable in the long term? I think that's that's important aspect to it too, because there are so many platforms that can be locked in, like uh, Jenny Evans just mentioned about the uh, Academia Edu and, and and other repository like uh, places. Uh, so so um, what we have done with our local podcast here at UIT is that we actually put it on a open journal system platform so that each podcast episode is uploaded there and gets a DOI, a permanent identifier. Uh, it's not the place where we expect podcast listeners to find them. So we also use SoundCloud. And from there, I believe it's it's automatically exported to Spotify and, and, and lots of other podcast apps. But, but yeah, perhaps it's me as a historian. I felt I want to take care of this material for the future. If if somebody, for instance, wants to to study the development of thinking in open science, they would uh, they would have uh, perhaps in in the future um, the need to to listen to a podcast series named Open Science Talk, <laughs> and it's there uh, for the future. So so that's an aspect of it to to try and um, not only be flashy and promote it i'm not so good at promoting myself i have to confess that but uh, at least i store them uh, somewhere where they are for the future so i think both both skills are important to promote uh, uh, open scholarly communication through podcasts yeah i'm actually so uh glad that i had the chance to listen to to, to your uh podcast series as well because i noticed that uh your episodes hit a doi and even though I've been doing uh, podcasting myself for years, I, it never even occurred to me that I could get actually a DOI for my for my work. So and 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 make it more uh, formally integrated into the the scholarly output system. So this is something that I learned myself through uh, through pre preparing for this conversation. So uh, that's very useful to know, and I think this can be uh, useful for others as well who are involved in humanities podcasting. Yeah, just uh, to follow up on yeah. that, it's uh, we also use uh, uh, how is it called Orc ID uh, for the mm -hmm. each interview e is supposed to have an Orc ID, so that's also automatically ingested into their CV on on Orcid. So it's it's um, and in to follow up also on this uh, Dora declaration, uh, it's all kinds of scholarly outputs should be evaluated by a committee uh, for uh, for a, a postdoc for instance so so that's then it can be good to have a even a podcast episode it, it goes to show that you you do uh, you do dissemination not just uh, research uh, for the ivory tower yes definitely and this and and and, and making it more formal uh through through uh, orchid and 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 giving it a DOI, I think this can even make it more so elevate their 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 um, prestige and the level of uh, uh, and and even their significance as a as a scholarly output. So I think this can because uh, there are there are discussions about this among humanities podcasters. So how seriously these podcast series are taken. Uh, by those who are not necessarily engaged in podcasting and whether or not these should be uh, an integral part of, of, of the evaluation of a scholar. So I think uh, knowing about this and being aware of these, uh, these, these possibilities can, I think, help 
uh, make this kind of um, a scholarly production more integrated into, into our work. Um, now, I think for the, for the last part of this, this conversation, I thought we could talk more about uh, the future of uh, open scholarly communication and how do you foresee that to change the social sciences and the humanities field? Uh, and, and how do you see its value being integrated into our work in the future? Wow. Uh, as a historian, perhaps I'm not the right person to talk about the future, <laughs> uh, but I could try. I, I think, as I said, the, I get at least personally some inspiration from the, the hard sciences. Um, they do things um, often very differently from us. For instance, if you have the author of a work in the humanities, you would definitely be the, the only author or perhaps maximum two authors um, that have written something together. That's that's the, the tradition, uh, at least in uh, history and philology, that where, where I tend to to be active. But in 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 the natural science, you know, you you, you can have tens and, and, and even hundreds of of, um, of authors. You can even have more than a thousand authors of one research article, which I think then is stretching it far too far. I, I don't think we should go in that direction. But this collaborative way of doing things and also giving credit to each other by by being co-authors. And if they follow the so-called Vancouver guidelines on, on co-authorship, then every everyone on the author list of an article has to have been part both on the planning of the research, of the conducting of the research, and of the, the actual writing of, of the work. Um, so, 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 so there I see a potential for to stimulate more co-authorship and also more collaboration within the humanities and social science. And, and I think we should learn from, from, from the example of, of other disciplines there, because um, we live in a world so attuned to communication and collaboration, uh, and I think we need uh, far more of that. So that's one, one positive sign for the future, I think, uh, for, for our fields, uh, that will be more collaborative. Um, there is a bad thing about the the, the world today. It's, it's concentration spans are so short. <laughs> uh, people tend not to read books anymore. Uh, they read short articles, and perhaps they even don't even or don't even feel they have the time to read an entire article. They read just the abstract and the conclusion, uh, and this uh, development is sad. Um, so, how to sort of uh, engage in this? Um, long argumentation, this uh, thoughtful way of doing things in the humanities when monographs are not being read. That is a, um, a paradox and, and a sad thing uh, where I don't think uh, increasing digital humanities, for instance, will, will actually help. Um, it, it doesn't sort of foster uh, concentrated, long a close reading it fosters more distant reading in in my experience so so it's uh, i see sad developments on the horizon but also good developments uh, for for our fields um, i don't know if that answers your question <laughs> well this is an open-ended question so <laughs> uh, i think there are a variety of ways of, uh, of approaching it and uh, so last but not least so you mentioned the term uh collaboration and i think this is something that's that's, that's somehow reminiscent of digital humanities too, because that's also seen as a as a as a as a platform for for collaboration between scholars in the humanities too, which may not necessarily be um, the traditional way of doing scholarship in the humanities, when people are just so used to focusing on their own individual work. And collaboration may need, may be something that that's new to a lot of people. Uh, but I'm also involved in, in collaborative projects, and a lot of the times we are based in different countries. So these tend to be uh, transnational uh, cooperations in many ways. Uh, and I was wondering, and this would be my last question uh, before we open it up uh, for further questions from the audience. So uh, do you see any, any um, so local specificities or local flair to, to the way 
uh, open sciences approach and what kind of, uh, or are there any uh, country specific resources that people should uh, keep in mind or are certain differences between countries and how they handle uh, open, uh, open projects uh, or, or is there something that's more um, at least Europe-wide, if not more global, but something that tends to be handled in a similar manner? manner. Yeah, that, that's where I'm, I feel I, I can't really be, I, I can't really answer that, I'm afraid. Uh, but what I could say about this transnationality, if, if I may, is, 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 is um, in the humanities, at least, uh, we tend to be very good at disseminating in our local languages. Um, so we we don't. It's not just our our speeches, our, our our teaching to 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 the general public is in, for instance, in Norwegian here in Norway. But it's also that we have certain journals and and uh, book series in Norway which are in the Norwegian language. So it's it's fully acknowledged as a way to practice. Uh, cutting-edge research in Norwegian, which is a language that less than 5 million people in the world can read, or perhaps some more can read it, but, but still, you know, you know what I mean. It's, it's a really, really small uh, language uh, community. Um, but I think um, we still need to publish this on open platforms uh, with no paywall, and, and with, uh, with the possibility for others to, to, to access it. But there can happen to be somebody abroad that do read Norwegian and need to read your work. So it should be available with good metadata and so on. Uh, but I guess what you asked more about was more about collaborative platforms and, and so on. And that's not my specialty. So I'll need that, leave that uh, to, to others in this uh, Zoom room, if, if I may. Okay, uh, by the way, we got, several comments on this from Isa and, and Carla as well. So you can unmute yourself if you want to and, and just share what you would like to add. Uh, so maybe you can, oh, okay. Carla already <laughs> unmuted yourself, okay. Okay. Uh, yes, this is an, a very important aspect for operas, uh, this uh, local and national differences because it's important for social sciences and humanities, and we think it should be preserved. So uh, dissemination, uh, the national language, etc. So operas has been focusing on that already through the multilingualism special interest group. But now with our most recent project, that is operas plus that will help us to further develop the operas infrastructure we are going to establish different national nodes. So uh, what is uh, produced and we, we can really have a, a better conversation with uh, different regions and, and countries and help this knowledge to circulate in different languages. So I think it's a very important uh, point, a very important aspect that we take into account and as I'm talking about operas, I would just like to add that uh, through the same project, uh, there's the innovation lab that is going to focus on different kinds of scholarly communication, not only the traditional paper. So it's something to pay attention to uh, as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you for adding this, Isa. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, just about uh, what kind of uh, country specificities may arise when uh, researchers from different countries collaborate. I was thinking that well, copyright may have something to say because in some countries there, uh, there are moral rights uh, and it may mean that uh, uh, researchers from those countries may be more protective. <laughs> I don't know whether it's true, but that they may be more protective about their writing. And uh, I don't know what kind of licenses, for example, they feel comfortable with. Um, and uh, well, like for example, in the US, they don't have moral rights. And yeah, we can uh, have a look at what kind of <laughs> collaboration issues maybe arise. Um, and uh, also 
uh, how uh, scholarly publishing has been organized in those countries. So in some countries, um, um, in Serbia, for example, um, they have, I don't think there have been so many uh, commercial um, uh, actors in scholarly publishing and it has been more uh, scholar, this, the whole sector I think have been more institutional and uh, scholar led than in the Western countries or in, in, in other countries where a lot of scholarly publishing has been outsourced to commercial actors. Uh, so yeah, that may also have something to say, I think. Oh, great. Thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, so I think these questions about uh, multilingualism, so language questions and licensing questions, I think we could even dedicate a whole uh, open chat event to these questions because these are just so broad, but also important. Uh, in the meantime, Carla has also shared a link to the multilingualism special interest group for those who are interested. Um, well, I think we've covered quite a few topics today in just an hour. Um, so uh, I would ask our audience if there are any other questions that you'd like us to, to discuss. <laughs> well, if not, then, uh, well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and special thanks to our guest, Pepe Binaspos. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and I hope you found this useful. So we've tried to, to cover a variety of different aspects of uh, open science in the social uh, sciences and the humanities. Uh, and please join us for the uh, future iterations of this open chat sessions as well. We will cover a variety of different topics uh, with the other members of the special interest group as well. So thank you again and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.